Keep your hand at the level of your eyes. It's time for Science! Science. Welcome to Sci Friday on Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert, and joining me, the Skywatch TV science editor, my best friend, my wife, Sharon K. Gilbert. Hi, honey. Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, that's kind of sure science, science fiction-y. Science, well, well, you know, yeah, kind of. a little odd. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was the best quote I could think of that people would actually have known. There were some others I had here that uh, were really obscure. But that's so a we didn't good go one, there. and it's important advice. Yes. Children, keep your hand at the level of your eyes, because <laughs> if you don't know that, you've not seen The Phantom of the Opera, and of course it refers to the phantom who loves to go around and take a little noose and just yes. jab them to death. Yeah. So we're just going to talk about science news. We've got all noose? kinds of news, oh, news? Yeah, from the uh, world of science. Uh, so there's a... You're running out of rope. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. Um, what now, are... now that they've quit watching. Exactly. Uh, well, let's rewind and pretend that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but it did. One of the stories that we keep seeing pop up in um, mainly the European media, the British media, uh, for some odd reason, for years, it seems to be fixated on what happened at the Yellowstone super volcano long ago and might again happen. Of course, it's a big, spectacular story, but yeah. this has been something that's floated around for quite a while. In fact, the BBC produced a special on this, a mockumentary, sort of a dramatization of what might happen if the supervolcano at Yellowstone were to blow. They did, but wasn't there also a sort of fictional, it wasn't a mockumentary, it was an actual drama that I think was BBC-based or ITV, one of the mm -hmm. British pro productions, um, that again, looking at Yellowstone and this fascination with yeah. doom, to be honest with you. Right. There, there are many websites out there and they're legitimate news sites that post story after story about doom coming to doom. Today's doom of the day. Yeah. Uh, doom coming soon. Keep your hand at the level of your doom because <laughs> it's coming at you. And, and I'm really not sure except that's something that probably you and I will discuss more when we actually start producing a new show that we are tentatively calling memes and media, mm -hmm. which is what we're being told to think. Right. And this applies to not to basically all news that we consume, not just science news, but uh, whenever we see something in the media, we have to train ourselves to ask, OK, why is this story n now? Well, why, why is this story being published now? Yeah. Well, let me tell you another thing in media, because we'll, we'll take a look at the volcano story more in depth probably on another show, because there are lots of people that we know who live close to there. Right. And Steve Quayle is one of them, in fact. Yes. And, and I, I would love to get his opinion, because he overflies the Yellowstone Caldera, what, once a week? Well, I don't once know if it's that often, but periodically. Yeah. But he, when he was here most recently, just a few weeks ago, he said that he and his son, who's a pilot, had flown over Yellowstone, and they do thermal readings mm -hmm. of the... Uh, the area around there. And there have been times in the past where the temperatures heated up and we've followed this story for years, know that there's a magma bubble underneath the lake there mm -hmm. at uh, Yellowstone that uh, uh, there were reports some years back of uh, how the ground was getting so hot in some places the asphalt was melting. And yeah, and they, there were uh, bison and other right. animal life that were dying presumably right. because of the heat or noxious vapors. Right, but as we discussed this, he said that his readings lately have not shown any unusual temperature changes. Mm. Uh, Steve lives in uh, Montana, mm -hmm. not far from, well, certainly close enough to that if the Yellowstone Caldera ever blew, Montana yeah. as we know it would well, honestly, be gone. If but the, he if said there's nothing blew, to worry about all, now. A lot of us in the Midwest would be gone. Right, right, yeah. Um, but he said as of right now, it, thinks, it seems to be very quiet. So mm. why the Express in particular in the UK keeps recycling the story <laughs> on about a 90-day cycle when you go back through history, about every 90 days, there's another, you know, will this blow up and destroy America and the world? You know? Well, today's story, they're talking about the Snake River Canyon. What right. they're saying is just as big, if not bigger, than the Yellowstone problem, and that it has right. more regularity and, and erupted more times. Mm -hmm. So the story, the, the crux of the story seems to be if something is likely to go off, this one's more likely than Yellowstone. Than Yellowstone. Well, yeah. I, I don't know, but we do know from prophecy from scripture that God says eventually this earth as we know it will be destroyed yeah. but before that happens there will be a 1000 year reign by mm -hmm. Jesus Christ right. but the 7 year period prior to that first year of the 1000 year reign there will be earthquakes yes. and volcanoes right. and natural disasters like we have never seen upon this earth and it's I'd say Yellowstone is a candidate sure so something to, to keep an eye on just for information's sake, but yeah. uh, don't let it breed no. a spirit of fear in you because uh, if this thing is, as with the, the 
discussion of planet X or planet Nibiru or Nemesis or planet 7X. Or the if, daily planet. Which or, is, or, yeah. <laughs> Great Caesar's ghost. <laughs> if there is, that would have been a good one. Anyway, oh, that uh, next time. The, the, the discussion of that planet, there, people have been watching that for years and, and fearing something awful coming to the earth. But yeah. if, in fact, this is a reality, if there is something approaching that we can't see yet, and I have my doubts that we would not see something um, you know, inside the yeah. orbit of Jupiter, uh, the size five or seven times the mass yeah. of the Earth. It is something that God is using to achieve His purposes. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll refer people to the Doug Elwell book, Planet X, The Sign of the Son of Man mm-hmm. and the End of the Age, yeah. um, and the work of you know, Gil Broussard, who's also shown that uh, yeah. this can be correlated to certain events in the past that God wanted to. And, and I suspect that that is one reason that the Lord God Almighty gave this information to us through John, through the prophets, through Jesus Christ himself. Right. Letting us know these terrible things were going to happen, but they were leading up to his return. Right. So rejoice, people. Amen. Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Right. Uh, with that in mind, this idea of sort of feeding uh, apocalyptic fear mm-hmm. to readers there's a new movie coming out that it's a franchise that you and I re- really enjoy, mm-hmm. the X-Men. Ah, X-Men, X-Men Apocalypse. X-Men Apocalypse yes. is going to be coming out soon. I think they're still in post at the very least on this. But you know what? I saw a trailer for it, and you can link to the story if you like, but the trailer is compelling. Some believe that the first mutant was born thousands of years ago. He was some kind of god. And he's going to rise again. My understanding of it is that a creature at the time of the Egyptian pharaohs, or Mm -hmm. even earlier, that they're referring to as an entity known as Apocalypse. Right. Apocalypse just means unveiling. Unveiling, right. Yeah. Revelation. a name. Yeah, exactly. Uh, But this creature, Apocalypse, has been bringing in those who are... um, Augmented, you know, those with the, the, the genes that have been changed, the X-Men mm-hmm. and women, and siphoning off their powers to become essentially the new god. Ah, okay. Sort of like Siler in the old television series Heroes. Very much like that. Mm. This guy in the trailer, he's even worse. And of course, all of the, this is the last in the newest trilogy, the new th- series of three movies that uh, uh, Brian Singer has been putting together mm-hmm. with uh, the younger versions of uh, Francis Xavier and, uh, is it Francis? Uh, Charles Xavier. Charles Xavier. Francis Xavier. Sorry, that gets into uh, Jesuits. other things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wrong one. Yeah. But you know, that's what, because Xavier means savior. Mm-hmm. This is not, and Charles means man. Yes, yes. So the, the, it's, it's very in your face and it's part of the, the programming young people in particular. Yeah. To, to, to take a look at what Old people like us talk about the apocalypse uh, uh, coming and the book of Revelation and the prophecies. And they'll just go, well, I'm sorry, but that's just another version of an old, that's just essentially an old graphic novel. Yeah, the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Prophecy is just, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and, and that's a really good point because one of the points that we've made in the the film, Inhuman, which now we can say is award winning, winning. Yeah. Uh, yes. which is really exciting, is that the transhumanists uh, and transhumanism is not just about extending human lifespan and about making the quality of life better, enhancing the quality of life. It's about becoming as gods. Well, there was even a story out this, uh, this year, um, sorry, this week where someone was making that very point. It was at Evolution News. Yeah. The article's written by Wesley J. Smith. Well, yes, and, and we love him. Right. But he makes the point mm-hmm. that uh, the, the whole, this is a religion, and it's all about self-directed evolution right. to enhance ourselves, to, to achieve uh, godhood on our terms. Right, on our terms. On our terms. Right. We want to live forever in these bodies. Who wants to live forever in these fallen bodies? I want that new body. Mm-hmm. I want the eternal, wonderful body that doesn't have the old fallen nature files well, that's, in it. And that's the key right there, because some of the transhumanists would say, well, no, I don't want this body. I want to be uploaded into a new improved body. I want to be in a, or I want to be uploaded into a cosmic mainframe where I exist as a disembodied pattern of energy where I can create myself into anything I want. Yeah. But the point, the key point is unregenerate. 
Exactly. Wesley J. Smith, by the way, is in the movie Inhuman, yes. the documentary. And his opinions, boy, you should just look him up on the Internet, read everything he writes. Right. He has a uh, blog that he writes at National Review Online called Human Exceptionalism. He approaches the topic from a non-religious perspective, which is good because, you know, the uh, arguments that we as Christians, open Christians, bring to the table will be rejected out of hand by the transhumanists mm -hmm. because, well, we're obviously biased and we can't, our information therefore is no good. Yeah. Uh, Wes doesn't go that direction. He approaches it from logic uh, and a, uh, uh, <clears throat> really tries to keep religion out of it so that his arguments can't be dismissed that easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is really the leading bioethicist on this side of the debate. And he has really pointed out some, some things that are, are just eye-opening. Now, of course, the gentleman that he's taking to task in this, this article you reference is Zoltan Ishtvan. Yes, who, who writes a lot for uh, the Huffington Post. Huffington Post and other websites around the, uh, the world. He, brilliant use of social media. Oh, he is. He is, he is brilliant. Yeah. I wish he would come to know Christ. Exactly, yeah. When you start with the presumption that there is no God or that there is no supernatural realm, Zoltan Istvan's worldview, the worldview of transhumanists, makes perfect sense. It does. Because if you believe that there is nothing after your final breath, then you consider it an imperative, even a moral imperative, to find a way to overcome that death, that death mm -hmm. is unnecessary, and, uh, uh, and it, it, that, well, he, he very lays out, it lays out his case in the novel, uh, The Transhumanist Wager. Um, he goes really beyond just saying we have a moral imperative to do it. He also goes to the point of making the case that anyone who tries to stop the transhumanists from achieving their goal is effectively condemning them to death. Well, and he also makes the point that if you really believe that with all your heart, that the transhuman agenda is the yes. way to go, then you are likely to believe that there are those who don't deserve to be upgraded. Right. Uh, and, and that gets into all kinds of other issues. Mm -hmm. Again, like, as you mentioned, the uh, idea of living forever with a bunch of people who's, who are still unregenerate, who've mm -hmm. not repented of their sins or even acknowledged <laughs> their sins, um, is like a way of creating a bunch of, well, superhuman villains like the yes. X-Men uh, character Very Apocalypse. Very much like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, praise God, he did not want that for us. He kicked us out of the Mount of Assembly, out of Eden, so that we would not have access to the tree of life. Right. Transhumanists want the tree of life, but they want to build it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you know, along the line of artificial intelligence and transhumanism, which we discuss a lot in here, because it's something that, that we, we really see happening all around us, but it's not necessarily in your daily news. It may not be on your Facebook feed. Mm -hmm. um, the military is coming out and saying, don't worry about us. We're not going to harm you. We plan no um, termini Terminator style robots in the field. However, we do plan on using human machine collaboration to improve the odds of making sure we hit back at the enemy the minute something is about to go wrong. Hmm. In a way, this is pre-crime, yeah. but it's also using autonomous robots and artificial intelligences to scrape all data from the Internet and quickly assess it in, in a millisecond mm -hmm. and make a decision. But the military is telling the world, but then that's going to be handed off to a human to make sure that that human is the one who actually pulls the trigger. Hmm. We're not going to arm these AIs in the field. Right. Well, if that really happens that way, then I will be surprised. But Robert Work, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, right. has gone on the record as saying, you, we're, we're not planning anything really evil. Hmm. We do no evil. We speak no evil. Yeah, we do no harm. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, he's, his name has come up in the past, uh, Mr. Work gave a speech in December and where he talked about enhanced human operations and the idea of enhancing human soldiers through genetics, nanotechnology, mm -hmm. robotics, and so forth. Um, and says, frankly, when we look at this topic, it really scares us. Yes. But the possibility that the Chinese or the Russians might develop this before us scares us even more. Yes, I know. And that's what we're seeing this over and over again. The other guy's going to do it faster and better, and we've right. got to do it first. We've got to get it there first. We have to f have the first super AI because the first SAI on the field wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is why 
we feel pretty confident that we are going to get to a point where a super intelligent AI at some point will be developed. Yeah. The question, of course, is whether that super intelligence will decide we humans are a threat to its existence and preempt us. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the Chinese have come up with something very similar for crowd control. It looks like a Dalek. We'll tell you about it when Sci Friday continues after this. Coming exclusively from Skywatch TV for a very limited time starting May 31st, 2016. When you purchase the new book and final report from Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Vatican's Last Crusade, you'll receive the largest giveaway of 2016, an unprecedented value of over $200 in free books, DVDs, audio files, and a data DVD library with tens of thousands of pages of ancient literature no longer available, as well as movies, WikiLeaks files the government does not want you to see, and more for your library or to give away as gifts. Included in this biggest giveaway of 2016 are Chris Putnam's full-length DVD presentation, Astrobiology and the Vatican ET Connection, the new five-part Skywatch TV special investigative report on the book, The Final Roman Emperor, plus two mystery books with a $40 value, and a data DVD library with thousands of pages of ancient literature, movies, and audio series for your library or to give away as gifts. And for the first several thousand customers, while supplies last, you'll also receive Satan's Dirty Little Secret, the two demon spirits that all demons get their strength from. Satan, You Can't Have My Promises, the spiritual warfare guide to reclaim what's yours. What Happens When I Die, true stories of the afterlife and what they tell us about eternity. Becoming a Prayer Warrior, a guide to effective and powerful prayer. An unprecedented value of over $200 in never-before-offered free products. And the biggest giveaway of 2016, yours absolutely free when you purchase The Final Roman Emperor from SkyWatchTV.com for only $19.95 plus shipping, beginning May 31st. But be advised, this astonishing promotion is limited to first-come, first-serve while supplies last. So it's urgent, beginning May 31st, 2016, you place your order for the final book and biggest prediction yet in this four-year investigation by internationally acclaimed best-selling authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Vatican's Last Crusade for only $19.95 plus shipping. This offer is on a limited time basis and will end without notification. So be sure to visit skywatchtv.com to follow the updates in the countdown to the biggest giveaway of 2016. Order the new book by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam on May 31st to receive the unprecedented value of over $200 while supplies last. Free products limited to quantity on hand and may be replaced by products of equal value. Doctor Who is one of our favorite programs here at Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert with Sharon Gilbert. We have been watching that program since we were knee-high to grasshoppers. I watched that show with my dad. Yep. Doctor number four. Yep. Tom Baker I came was in with, my first doctor. Oh, I got in earlier than you. I was with doctor number three, John Pertwee. Well, they were the they were the ones that are currently being run on PBS. Yes. So I got in on that and then watched the old ones too. Yeah, but the uh, <laughs> modern iteration is extremely well done. Uh, and of course, one of the the villains, the, really the first really scary villain 50 years ago with doctor number one uh, was the Daleks. Yes. It, you know, there, there are stories from children in Britain when the show aired the first time hiding behind the couch because they were so terrified of the Daleks. Well, the uh, Chinese have come up with something. I don't know if you've seen this story. I haven't. Oh, it does kind of look like a Dalek. Yeah, and it has been developed. Or a big trash can. Well, can yeah, it, I'm not sure if it's cute or frightening, but it's got a shield on the front, which sort of indicates its role. It is intended for security. It's the mm -hmm. first intelligent security robot, which reportedly uses an electrically charged riot control tool uh, <laughs> and has an SOS button, gun? something like that. Um, but of course, the comparison to Doctor, the Daleks of Doctor Who has not gone unnoticed. So uh, the, the, the thing is, as we look at something like this, and I just bring this up as an example of the kind of thing that we're moving towards. Yes. You start implanting these and, and empowering these with artificial intelligence and give them the autonomy to begin acting on their own. Mm -hmm. we, we get into some very dangerous territory. Um, 
I, th this is called the AnBot, built by the National Defense University in China. I would not be surprised to see this deployed, not just in China, but elsewhere around the world mm -hmm. in the years ahead. And again, this is the kind of tool, especially married to an AI, that could be really, really useful to a future one world government. Well, again, everything that is interconnected, everything part of the Internet of Things, has the potential to be a useful tool to the first artificial intelligence. And I know we get emails saying, you're not going to see a true you know, super AI arise. Perhaps not if you rely only on the code. <clears throat> but if electrical impulses and electrons moving throughout space, if, if this can be a fit extension for habitation, then yes, I would say we could get a spiritually controlled artificial intelligence right. that if it has access to all of these things, it, it would control not only these defensive robots, but also all of the offensive things that are connected to the Internet. Mm -hmm. This has the potential to fulfill everything we see in the book of Revelation. Yeah, and... Uh I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again because I think this is fascinating. A hundred years ago, the uh, na renowned Bible scholar E.W. Bullinger, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, which you can find online in PDF form, you know, confirm that what I'm saying here is accurate. He thought, based on the recent work in his day of um, Nikola Tesla, who had announced that he was working on an artificial brain, yeah. that this could be the way the uh, Antichrist would fulfill the prophecy of giving life to the image of the beast yes. uh, through an artificial intelligence. Yeah, Nikola Tesla, by the way, is going to make an appearance in my novel series. Oh, <clears throat> awesome. Oh, yes. Got to bring him in. Well, we are speaking of things that may go awry and speaking of the Internet. And there was a story that really caught my eye this morning. I have to look, see how much time we have left. Story of the accidental, air quotes, $137,000 Bitcoin payment oh. that went strange, mm. went awry. That would um, ruin your day. Well, if you're not familiar with Bitcoins, uh, again, my understanding of this is very basic, but my, my understanding is, first of all, it may well be a pyramid scheme. That's mm -hmm. one claim by, by uh, uh, police authorities and, and folks who are looking at those involved. But even if it is not, mm -hmm. say you wanted to sit at home and use your computers to make money. Mm -hmm. You would essentially run programs that do the bookkeeping for the Bitcoin enterprise. Mm. Because your electricity and many other things go into making this, this work, and it's, it's a very complicated routine, and they have to be done exactly right because all of these Bitcoin transactions that take place on the web, and m many of them take place in the dark web, which right. is going to set you up for another story, I think. Um, these are ways of paying for things that have to be verified. <clears throat> the verification process involves taking all these transactions and then essentially converting them into one long string of, of code. Mm -hmm. So it is sort of crushed down into this sums up, this transactions for these events, for this day. This code is in some ways like dominoes because code A defines what code B will be. B will define C mm -hmm. and on down. So your computing power is taking care of those things and in exchange for it, when it is verified that you've been done it right, you get, and I think some of them give you $25 in bitcoins. You might be able to do that once an hour. Hmm. You might okay. be able to do it only once a day. But at one time, bitcoins were trading for over $1,000 US mm -hmm. per coin. So it's, it's a nice way to make some change. Sure. But essentially, you are mining coins from your home all the time. Mm -hmm. Someone apparently went through and supposedly wanted to send $5 to buy something mm -hmm. small. And the fee that was collected was $137,000. Wow. Instead of the other way around, mm -hmm. which is what the person is now claiming. I meant to send $137,000. Now, the, the story is getting stranger because it looks like this person who actually did the transaction may have received the money in, an, in 13 separate accounts. It's, yeah. it's a strange thing, but I bring this all up to explain the dark web and how things are paid for on the dark web. The dark web is essentially an area of 
interconnected computers that are not visible to Google and other search engines. Right, right. You have to actually go to what's called a Tor or Onion mm -hmm. server. Uh, I think it stands for, um, oh gosh, uh, Onion Router. The Onion Router or, uh, anyway, the Tor stands for yeah, something, yeah. Onion Router. Um, so you go to something.onion. Facebook has its own .onion uh, URL, which is now part of the dark web. It's been up since mm -hmm. late 2014, and now they are getting, I think, them something like 50,000 new users a month. Yeah, um, I read about this the other day and didn't um, flag the story, but as I recall, they've got over a million users now to their dark web site. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, and we only have a couple of minutes left, so we really can't develop this story very far, but I think this relates to Facebook's investment in the Oculus Rift virtual reality goggles and the uh, ultimate payoff for Facebook's multi-billion dollar investment in that technology, which is virtual pornography. Well, I agree with that. And I think that that's something we need to discuss at length. Uh, again, don't have a whole, whole lot of time, but just so you know, your children may be inhabiting the dark web. So mm -hmm. take a look at where they go online. One nice thing about these computers that uh, we were able to get this past year, thanks to many people helping mm -hmm. out, was that uh, uh, whenever you are op open up a new tab on uh, your browser yeah. or, or in your mail program, it pops up on my dock saying, hey, there's something new. Want to see it? Yeah. And I think is if you were, you know, my 10 year old, I would definitely go and look. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, our kids are doing things we're not aware of. Exactly. So uh, we'll talk more about that. We have a guest coming in for Skywatch TV later this year whose ministry is all about that. And we'll yes. get into some detail on this. But, uh, yeah, there are apps to communicate that uh, we parents, grandparents, don't even know our kids have access to. And it was frightening realizing how little I knew because I know that we are pretty, uh, pretty tech savvy. Well, I think we try to be, but, you know, there are always things going on that I'm not aware of, which... Um, if you as a family member, if you're a grandma, grandpa, parent, uh, mom or dad, or even aunt and uncle, if you know of something that we don't, <laughs> let us know. It's Sci Friday at skywatchtv.com. Mm -hmm. And you'll see our web address for the Facebook page for Sci Friday right here. We appreciate the tips and uh, stories you send our way because as much as we comb the news, we can't find them all. This week on Skywatch TV, of course, the announcement of the big, uh, re well, the big announcement, the release of the Skywatch TV magazine. You'll see that on Saturday on the Victory Television Network in Arkansas and around Memphis. And again, coast to coast on the Christian Television Network. And uh, next week, Steve Quayle kicks off five weeks of discussion of um, technology of the fallen and especially the Vatican's involvement in covering things up. Mm -hmm. So uh, some fascinating stuff coming up on Skywatch TV. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, have a blessed weekend. Until next time, for Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert. Thank you for watching as we keep watch. And this is Skywatch TV.